Uh, there we go. This is this is the Rex call for Wednesday, March tenth, twenty twenty one. Seriously, how did the calendar roll all the way forward to there? Brad, awesome, love to see you all. April will be joining us momentarily. Uh, <clears throat> without video, it's just a little too early for her to be all put together and all that. So, what about Susan Stuckey? What's up with her? Is she still in London? Uh, she's back, and I uh, she was on last week's call, last month's call. So, I don't know. I'm assuming she may join us. I do not know. Well, it's so nice to see everybody. Yeah, yeah. Like I just want to fell like in the moment. Like Zoom allows us to sort of convene in, in new and non, well, slightly non greenhouse gas worrying ways. I gotta say, I'm thinking about how Mika called it and said, "Oh, we're not gonna say there's a coup d'état happening," and then boom, January sixth. So, Mika, you were protecting us from the nightmare, but sorry, the nightmare still happened. But thanks, man. Came close, didn't it? Yeah. Came close. I mean, I remember before the election taking a straw poll of, uh, in a couple places with a couple of conversations about will there be violence in the streets sort of uh, right, you know, at the election or after the election. And it's like, nope, that didn't happen. And uh, it was they were just like waiting. Like the energy was just building up until until before the inauguration. So, yeah, no, they they didn't shoot very many people there. I, I have a friend who lives in. Uh, uh, up in the Catskills, very, very progressive person uh, who has been living in this little town for a long time. Um, and she said this fall was weird because it was quiet because normally you hear uh, people out hunting uh -huh. and um, she thinks people were conserving their ammunition. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, seriously? No, that's precisely how Good. I would interpret it. She's right. The hunting season. Screw the deer. We need to worry about the neighbors, honey. <laughs> Sorry, Bo. Go ahead. Hey, Susan. <laughs> glad to see you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Man, such, we're, we're having a weird time in Portland because uh, during the famous Portland protest season, the protests were sort of downtown, which is less than two miles away from where we are. It's walking distance. I went down and joined for an evening, but, by, but down by the courthouse in Southwest. Um, the last three weekends, there have been Antifa branded protests starting in the parks near us here in the Pearl District in Northwest. So the last two started in Fields Park, which is just, just east and north, like six, seven blocks that way. And there's one start. There's one happening scheduled for this Friday at 8 p.m. It's got like a poster, um, and starting in Jameson Park, which is a sweet little park that's normally a little water fountain for kids in the summertime. And last season wasn't because lockdown. But they're just sort of going around and breaking shit. So um, there were broken windows on Lovejoy Street, which is the street right. I can sort of stare down on on that street from our window, uh, and we. April and I, at least, were not involved politically in that way here, but we can't figure out what, it, this is not Black Lives Matter, this is not, it's not even like Democrats aren't being radical enough, I, like, this is just like, we're going to meet and be angry and break things, yeah. and it's really dysfunctional, so I'd love to, I'd love to pop the hood on this and figure out what's, you know, what's going on, but it's just another yeah. sign that we're all doomed, Yeah, uh, but we're not doomed because there is hope, right? Long-term hope. <clears throat> And, and if my, we really, if we have a revolution, wait, wait, really, wait, wait. There's hope if we have a revolution. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't but you? Thought, you saw the video. But does yeah, that mean if that. we avoid the pitchforks in the streets? Um. Or does that mean we should get pitchforks? Pitch, pitchforks are optional. Oh. Okay. Bring <laughs> this is BYOP. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, B BYOFI. Bring your own farm implement. It doesn't have to be a pitchfork. I thought the F was going to be something else there. <laughs> and my cousins in Iceland, uh, there's a bunch of earth earthquakes and stuff and volcanoes rumbling in Iceland, FYI. Yeah. The apocalypse. Whole series of them. And same thing there's... in New Zealand, I think. They're having a bunch. Hey, maybe Europe will be cut off by air travel again. And, and lots of fireballs and meteors, if you've noticed. Oh, I've not seen that. And no. the Gulf Stream has stopped. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Other than that. <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> yeah, Bill, um, Jerry, do you remember Bill Calvin talking about that at GBN back in like 96, 97? 
yeah. it's just a couple decades yeah. too early. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we had uh, so in Open Global Mind, this thing I've sort of uh, spawned during uh, lockdown. We had a new participant come in, and I think he's dropped out. I think he's a he. I don't know. I, actually, I do know he's a he. And he dropped in and basically started like peeing on everybody's arguments. And um, uh, and part of it was the the Atlantic gyre and the gulf whatever he's like that doesn't matter this other thing is more important and then and a, a few things like that and i i ended up sort of interrupting like a list mom on the list going hey dude if you approached us nicely we're probably the right place we're probably a good tribe for you because you're trying to convince people of some argument and that's mm -hmm. we're all about visualizing and arguing and and trying to figure out causal whatevers um but he his emotional intelligence was like in the basement, like seriously in the basement. Um, so but on the other hand, I, I think his intention, and I totally agree that he approached it completely the wrong way, but, but I think the intention resonated a bit with the subtext of your video, Jamin, which is like, kiss our asses goodbye. <laughs> or alternatively, <laughs> we can say, you guys are just rearranging deck chairs. Right. You know? yeah. you, and one of my questions back to him on the list was, okay, so I watched some of your stuff and read some of your stuff. So you seem to say that there's nothing we individually can do anyway. So, so don't bother. So why are you here? <laughs> like, like wrecking the chairs um, instead of helping figure out how to take individual action and take collective action. So it was really interesting. Kind of missed the disruption. Um, Jamie, do you want to, do you want to like, um, Go into a reverie and put yourself back in the place of, of the talk and uh, uh, take us into any part of it that 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 you wish everybody could absorb somehow. Right. Um, I think one of the you know, there were there were several underlying themes for me. One is that moderation isn't enough. You know, I had a throwaway line in there that. If any plan seems politically feasible, it's probably not fast enough. Um, but I think the most important theme of it was that what we're going to end up needing to do, and in many ways, what we'll end up doing uh, in order to grapple with the climate emergency and all the ancillary aspect or elements of it, uh, will have enormous repercussions for people who are the least able to deal with it. And you know, the story I was trying to tell with that isn't that isn't just that we're going to have to do big things, is that if we do big things and don't pay attention to the consequences, a lot of people are going to get hurt. You know, it's the move fast and break things becomes move fast and break people. Mm -hmm. I, I really like that you brought you just said that, Jamaica, because you know, we did free trade and we did the same thing. We didn't care that it broke the blue collar of people. We destroyed them. Yeah, it's like, well, yeah, well, it'll, in a generation or two, it'll be fine. And I don't, I don't think we, that is, I don't think that's, that's ethical, um, but I don't think that's sustainable in, in the most rudimentary way. That, that, that notion of, you know, we'll run over the ne next generation or two, but then it'll work itself out. Uh, and, and so the, the story I was trying to tell with this is that combination of this is going to take a lot of effort and some big changes will be necessary. But if we just focus on the climate, we just focus on this one problem, we're going to have so many cascading repercussions that will be harmful to everyone and ultimately harmful to our civilization. And so the the scenario, the, the teeps, items that I that I throw out there as being this is what a revolution could look like. I, I really went in with the notion of how you know how do we do this in a way that is that embraces humanity? How do we how do we save the planet there, there is the there is the free humanity? the free hugs movement literally does that. You know I, I have no objection to that. Okay. Except for social distancing makes it difficult. Good point. But it does appear to not help with these problems. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mika. So Jamee, I love the video, um, and I've shared it around. And and uh, one of the people I sent it to is the president of Consumer Reports. Oh, whose board I sit on, and she said she loved it. So just always Wonderful. nice Thank to know you. where the ripples hit. Um, you could go to Yonkers. Yeah. Well. <laughs> 
<laughs> I've been in their facility. I did one trip to. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right. <clears throat> long, long on a planet uh, far, far away. Go ahead. Sorry. So I was going to ask about the activation of this sea change that that you're arguing for, and ask you if you've looked at Kim Stanley Robinson's book, The Ministry for the Future. Um, and for folks who haven't read the book, I'll I'll just give away the first part. Um, which is that he, you know, sort of premises that we're in this scenario we're in, and then there's this horrible climate shock. Uh, a massive heat wave hits India, and in a matter of days, 20 million people die. And that radicalizes a portion of Indian society as well as the government. So the government starts doing some things that are like off the table right now, like, uh, you know, seeding the atmosphere to slow global warming temporarily. And the, uh, some portion of the people become so radicalized that they start doing things like um, deliberately blowing up uh, commercial airplanes to basically kill air traffic, you know, basically discontinuous change and but that triggers uh more political will to actually take more radical steps mm -hmm. and and his his key idea is the idea that the central bankers of the world create a new currency that rewards people for um, not using carbon that could totally happen that could totally happen well, it's a really interesting idea, um, though it's not going to happen because there's no political will to make it happen. So mm -hmm. it, his theory is sooner or later, there's going to be such a huge climate shock that there will be radicalization. And when you combine that with the democratization of, of uh, violence, right? So people using things like drones to take out, you know, oil company executives or something. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very curious what you think of that. I assume you're familiar with his, his book. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it is, I, I don't want to say it, it, the exact same scenario that I've, that I've written before, but it, it, it maps to a lot of stuff that I've written in scenarios before about what that kind of, catal what kind of catalyst would be necessary. And unfortunately, the way our world is working it works right now we do we will need some kind of big um, seismic shock to to get people to change their change their behavior and I, I lament that I mean, it's really it it's very frustrating to me and I as I said at the beginning of the talk we know what to do we have the means to do it we just don't have the will we're just not making ourselves do it. Um, and I, I, I honestly, I haven't read the book yet, um, but I'm familiar with it. And I've met Stan a few times and, uh, you know, he and I see, he and I see eye to eye on a number of things. Um, and, and I have to say that the, the pieces of it that I've seen, it is one of the more optimistic scenarios. Hmm. Um, including, you know, mega deaths, you know, mm -hmm. unfortunately, mm -hmm. and you know, this is, uh, it could be a lot worse. Me, I and mean, one of the things that really, one of the things about the the that particular scenario that worries me is that he is positing that essentially the Indian government will be will act semi responsibly after this, as opposed to <clears throat> what we would expect from Modi. For example, sure. Um, you know, and the, the potential I mean, a heat wave that that knocks that knocks down twenty million people in India is going to have is is not going to be limited just to those borders. So you imagine that Bangladesh, which is all, always suffering, and Pakistan will be hit would be hit by something like that too. And the the potential for nuclear conflict between the two between Pakistan and India is a nightmare. And two thirds of Bangladesh is at sea level. Yeah, 
mm-hmm. and has insane. That's where the population is. Daca and, and yet they're persistently like, the happiest population survey. I thought it was Denmark. Well, I, I've, I've, I've read. I read also at sea level. Yeah, it's if you, it's if you know life is is finite, you you're forced to be happier. Okay. Um, um. <laughs> I, I actually have I say I, the the scenarios that I've the serious official scenarios that I've seen from various businesses and government, you know, but I don't want to say it definitely shell, but that kind of level of organization, you know, I won't, I won't say it's the CIA, but that level of organization, they all pretty much write off Bangladesh and as a climate, as a climate victim. Um, there's, there's uh, and whether they talk about it in terms of evacuating people or um, mourning them, mm. it just depends on the nature of the scenario. So what I, you know, trying to come up with what a, what a good world, a good plausible, but revolutionary world could look like. Um, as I was doing that, the the phrase polymorphic thinking, popped up, and as I tend to do with the when I have an idea like that, I, I tend to throw it out there before it's fully fleshed out just to see how people react, what, what ideas it spawns from other people. And so if the polymorphic thinking section seemed a little um, shoehorned in, it kind of was. But at the same time, um, I think it did illustrate the, the we, that it, it was an illustration of the fact that we can't just keep using the same tools we have been using, um, keep going on the same path we have been going on. Also, I, I want to apologize for the blah, 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 uh, one, one or two points and the misgranagement. Misgranagement. I, don't know if you, I mi- thought you were creating more terms. Yes. Everyone in my family who saw the video pointed out misgranagement. Nice of them. Um, you can and, thank you. And Kelly, do you want to riff on what you just put in the chat? Please. Please do. Uh, so I've been thinking a lot about I'm, I'm listening to this conversation being like, we couldn't even look six months ahead this year, right? In terms of the framing of all the things that happened this last year, our the story I think is that our overriding um, selfishness <laughs> and um, just prevented us from doing things that really could actually have knocked down the pandemic in a much shorter period of time. And so I'm sitting here sort of like hyperventilating about the fact that, oh my God, this is just evidence that we, that we have, there is no hope, right? Like uh, the, the idea of like, sure, there's long-term hope after the revolution. And we, <laughs> we had an opportunity to do that and didn't, we could have rebuilt a lot of different things this year and didn't. Um, and so I'm, so of course I'm, I think as maybe Jamey's alter ego in terms of putting this positive spin on everything. Um, I'm wondering if there are things that did go well this year that we could actually sort of start to shift the story about, about the things that we did in terms of this was a huge shock to the system, right? There, there are things that, that maybe we did do well and what are the things that we might wanna keep in mind as we come into the next thing, right? Because well, there's going to be say, there's going to be more shocks to the system. So oh, what? Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> and, and I actually I, lo- I love the the um, depiction of this last year as a dress rehearsal. Yeah, <laughs> I think that that's spot on. Um, uh, one thing I can say that I, I think that this last year has moved forward the um, the emergence of of a persistent basic income slash assets model by at least a decade. Because we're seeing that happening in a variety of places, you know, something something that parallels a basic income, and it works. It see, it very visibly works in a lot of places. In fact, just a report just came out about Stockton, the the five hundred dollar a month basic income test in Stockton, California. Yep. Employment went up as a result. It what did not cause people to stop working. It caused more people to get jobs because there was more money going into the economy. The N is really tiny on that study, but I agree. The, the, like the number of house, it was one year with a, just a few, like a couple hundred households. So the N is really small, but still the, 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 the trend is good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, point being that w- one of the responses we've seen globally 
not in the United States uh, for the most part, but globally is this um, income support. I mean, they did that in New Zealand. Uh, they did it to an extent in Canada. Uh, I think they were doing it in the UK. And it doesn't, it obviously, if you take the UK as the example, it doesn't do much in terms of um, preventing the pan spread of pandemic, but it does help to keep um, the economy afloat. Um, and so I, I think that th we will probably see the normalization of basic income models happening much more quickly than we would have before. Um, I, sus I suspect that we will ultimately en end up with a, um, in the United States, with something closer to a um, universal health care model and as a result. It, I swear, I think I said this with said this to you before, Jerry, that if, um, if uh, COVID had hit in uh, like six months earlier, um, we probably would would have seen Sanders versus Trump for the 2020 election, you know, just because of that universal you know, health care, universal health care push. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what the result would have been, but uh, um, uh -huh. anyway, so I, I think the what the pandemic as the pandemic dress rehearsal period has done is actually um, shifted the Overton window. On a lot of on a lot of issues that had seemed semi radical in the past, uh, so um, yay. But um, yeah, the the fact that so many Americans, you know, there are still so many people who refuse to accept that the, that the COVID, that COVID is real, right? Still, right. <clears throat> so two quick observations on that. One is um, you would think that a common enemy would drive everybody together. So a bug that's really tiny, that's killing people, and it didn't. It actually divided us and locked us up in ways that are like really dramatic and we're still sort of living through. Um, the second thing is one of my biggest hopes, and I put a link to the thought in my brain, is like, was 2020 a tipping point? Does 2020 mark a, a, tip, a generational tipping point? Because Greta Thunberg and the Sunshine Movement and the Stone, Mar Marjorie Stoneman Douglas school kids against you know guns and all of that, like... If we, if we of the uh, uh, people of a certain age could be helpful to those generations and could help them link arms and not become one homogeneous massive thing, but rather um, couple up and wipe out a generation of leadership that's busy like, you know, even down to Tom Cotton's and Josh Hawley's and all those kinds of people like who are, who are intentionally jamming the works because it works, because it gains power and they get status and look at this, you know, look at me. And, and they really have uh, astonishingly little regard for what happens to humans, it seems. But can we help the younger generation? Can we be of service? And what does that mean? And how does that work? And as a throwaway, I put in the in the chat, I don't know if you thought of this before, Jamey, but your positive alter ego should be called Toujours Casio. <laughs> yeah. It Doesn't that seem sort of like an obvious thing? If, and if I were you, I'd buy the Twitter handle like now. <laughs> or well, not buy. Other... Yeah. I, I love this notion that 2020 was a dress rehearsal, but I also think it was a dress rehearsal on the weaponization of Facebook and social media to make you believe anything and make well, it seem I think 2016 was a dress was a dress rehearsal 2020 was the implementation and it came really damn close to working no no it, it, well it's still working I mean that's the point right so yeah. could you leverage that same beautiful technology to have everybody become aware and focused on what's afoot looking that's at who yeah. Susan? Susan has an observation here, it looks like. <laughs> I was just say, going to say, I saw, I'm sorry, I sound like a, a whatever, whatever that thing is that keeps repeating itself. Broken record. Broken record. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but yes, you could leverage that. In fact, that's how to do it. I mean, there's that to go to the point that I thanked Jemmy for so effusively several months ago um, was that the, the, the social dynamics for the achieving good are the same ones that are for achieving bad. We can't, it's it's not, it, and to, to, I don't know, Jeremy, uh, Jerry, I can't uh, get your, sorry, I haven't talked enough lately. <laughs> <laughs> Use your words, Susan. Use your words. Practice on us. Practice on us. 
<laughs> anyway, what I was going to say to, to your point, Jerry, that you said, well, you thought that, that, that rational, whatever. I mean, it's not a rational argument, right? Yeah. It has mm -hmm. to be appeal to emotions. It has to appeal to, what was your second thing? I keep forgetting the other one. You said it's emotion and. Oh, I'd say um, uh, membership. Membership, yes. Yeah, emotion that and membership, membership trump logic most of the time. I've got a thought on that. It just It's yeah. just the way things are. And we have to learn how to leverage that. We don't have to, I think, or maybe we do, do all the nasty things that other people do and tell lies. But we do have to employ that because that's that's the human condition. The, the um, neuroscience studies seem to point to um, fear and um, anger stimulation being more effective at changing minds than um, hope and um, empathy stimulation. So why don't we, well, so, I, I don't want to go off on a rant, but your, your talk this morning made me reflect just a little bit mm -hmm. on um, a question that I asked back in, in the 80s when I started out at the Institute for Research on Learning, which was, how does learning actually happen? You know, we keep wanting people to learn stuff that they don't want to learn it and they learn, but they learn all, perfectly well all the time. That was my, that was my, my line. And I think mm -hmm. we made some progress in understanding the social dynamics of that, which have never been used properly uh, in my view, but um, they're the ones that we need to respect now. And so I asked the question, as you talked about transformation and I got completely sidetracked thinking about that while you were talking. So I'll go back and listen again. But I asked myself the same kind of question, which is, how does transformation actually take place? Right. What, what kind of a phenomenon, if we could see it happening, to go to Kelly's point, when it's happening, what took place? And I think I've used that example of cleaning up the, uh, uh, the uh, Cuyahoga in Ohio before with this group. And what it took was a long time. We don't have time. It did take a long time, but the social dynamics of it are the same social dynamics that we need to kind of employ here. And so while I agree that we have, we know what to do, I would say the one thing we're forgetting is that in any of these cases, and I don't, I'm happy to talk at any scale. I mean, I think the, I think the process is fractal. Um, and the, is, is that it has to include the social, the physical, which we keep leaving out, and the technological. So just take those three things and are they present? In any conversation, are, they all, are those things present? And those things are gonna to have to change at once because no change takes place without respect for the particular physical environment in which it's taking place. Mm -hmm. The scale is necessarily small, but if you look at us, trying to talk about this. We're, we're employing the technical, we're employing the social, we're not employing the physical so much. Deliberately, we have to have it, right? There's all those servers out there. But um, I'm just thinking that it's gotta be a way to, um, to bring those three things together and insist that we address them at the same time. Um, and uh, I spent years trying to get corporations to address the facilities, the technology, the social, the this all at once. And I had that horrible experience at, at uh, HP, which I'm sure was, was a moment for me. And I'm sure I've told you about it before, but when I walked in and I got them all the VPs in the room at one point, I thought, oh shit, now what? Um, but I think it's something like that kind of social configuration um, has to be part of it somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, the how do we do it? Yeah, is yeah, the yeah. is the 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 refrain that has no answer yet. I mean, maybe maybe we'll never have an, a satisfying answer. Well, I think there's um there's a whole genre of lessons from history, um, and there's also a literature about how we take the wrong lessons from history. We tend to reach back to the nearest, most familiar historic reference and think, oh, it's, this is just like the Great Depression or like the you know whatever. And then it's usually that that's a, those analogies are usually bad, but there's usually something else that's actually pretty good. And a piece of this for me is about how did, how do large social movements start? Whether it's the enclosure movements and the, the beginnings of industrialization, capitalism, and what we now consider sort of like the water we live in 
is that everything has a price and that there's kind of markets for the idea that, that water is free because you just get it from the creek and that your plants and, and, and whatever, you just grow them in the backyard and you don't pay for food and you exchange your, the carrots you just dug up with your neighbors who just slaughtered a pig. Like, like, like those ideas have just vanished in a quaint way, but that was how we used to live until 250 years ago. Like, like that, was, that was how life worked until only 250 years ago for let's call it 40,000 years of human civilization, right? Um, and tending the landscape together, uh, understanding what commons were, all those yeah. kinds of things yeah. are buried really deep in indigenous traditions that we've managed to just cover over, light a match to, and try to stamp out really hard, which we are now like, oh, that's kind of cool. They have some cool wisdom. We should maybe, let's bring them into the conversation, but only just a little bit, because what they say is always so heretical, right? So, so, what, so how does, was that, was how that does, true for, de for dense urban populations as well? Um, you say it's up until 250 years ago, you know, people, when your neighbor slaughtering, you know, slaughtering a pig, if you're in the middle of the city. So, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, go, go to a slum in Bombay, right? Uh, that, that happens all the time. I mean, right. those, those <laughs> things, those things are still going on. I mean, to Kelly's point, you know, where are things, where are things we want to shine a light on? And can we shine a light on a whole bunch of them? Yes, because I think in the vaccine, I mean, being in England was wonderful in the sense of being out of the U.S. and out of our own immediate, you know, problems and an emotional relief, extraordinary emotional relief. But I could see from what we got over there in the in the British press that, um, you know, that there were tons of things happening on a small scale all over the place. And just because Trump didn't, it took longer, right? In some sense, but in the end, I mean, and in the end, Britain got good at vaccines only because Boris was gonna lose his job and he finally got the picture. But uh, the implementation is terribly local um, and it's copied. And I, if I had, uh, you know, a million dollars or two I think I think going into those situations, right, and unpacking how they learned from each other, which I know goes on, right? Friends of friends talk and say, well, you know what, we're, we're putting it in the pharmacies. Well, how did you do that? You know, that stuff is going on all the time. Otherwise this wouldn't happen. The, 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 big, the big words that everybody has about how, how you're achieving scale, you have to have that, that local, that, that embedded stuff going on and it goes on. It goes on all the time, never stopped. Uh, and just because we're talking on Zoom doesn't mean that what we're talking about, I mean, what we're doing is very local. <laughs> we're just a few people sitting here talking about grand, huge things, but it's changing our minds and it's doing a lot of important things. Um, so yeah. And I don't understand why, well, I guess I do understand why during the pandemic, we haven't seen a flurry of research projects that try to unpack that. But I think it's because we don't unpack, you know, everybody says, well, but you know, nobody will ever do it. I said, well, wait a minute, it happens all the time. How does it happen when it's working? You know, and, and having research techniques that actually uncover how it's working when it's working is a very different conversation. And um, having beaten my head against the wall for 40 years, I think uh, it's still the right question to ask. And it always turns up surprising things, except, except that they don't, uh, well, I'm gonna give an example. I'm not gonna try to summarize that point. So Jerry put me in touch with another Mennonite whose name is uh, Lavon Reimer. Okay, we've been having a great time. So she, she's writing a book and I'm trying to be an ear or two, but she was telling me about something that she tried, which we were trying to figure out what it was to be, what, would, what it would be to be men about these things. How would we do things differently? How do we do things differently? How do we get in trouble because we're Mennonites? You know, it's like all these good things. But anyway, uh, she was talking about a meeting that she finally got, had all these people together from all the different, um, an ethics meeting, an ethics training in a company, Tektronix, I think it was. And she um, had all these people who were 
brought together, you know, the, the frontline workers with the HR people with the this and the that, and they had everybody in the room, right? And she could see the guys in the hard hats in the back sitting there with their arms folded. And her idea was that it, her idea was that it wasn't, that they weren't there dissing the whole thing. They were there because they were physically uncomfortable. And she had them, she went through one of these stand up and whatever's and sort yourselves out and uh, gave them a case which you would all remember and I'm not gonna go through it uh, right now, but a case in which you know you could decide to go over and help these people and give these people money or you could go back and do what you were doing before. And the, the guys in the hard hats went, started to walk over to where they knew she wanted them to go and they stopped. And then they went back to where they were. Okay. And I mean, she proved her point that it was, and, and, but it was a physically embodied thing. Right. And I think that that's going to be part of her point to that story, but it was, a, uh, you know, we're going to have to use every trick in the books that we have for human engagement. And we're going to have to stop, you know, we're going to have to stop dissing people. I mean that I think the movie what was the name of that the the these re, the reunited states the reunited states yeah yeah the reunited states Jerry um yeah because I was on jet lag I watched the thing in the middle of the night anyway it was perfect so but that was I went away hopeful I came home just thinking I was I just didn't want to be here anymore mm. and um and then I watched that and I thought oh okay that can happen and of course, if you kept going at the end of the movie, the touching point, the really strong point to me was the woman who had lost her daughter in Charlotte and, and, and the couple end up in Charlotte. Um, it's not in the movie itself. It's in the, it's in the, it's in the afterward things. And she says, who lost her daughter in Charlotte and was invited to dinner. So the couple with the, with the, with the bus, you know, ends up in, moving to Charlotte from Texas. And they invite her, her I forget her name, uh, to dinner with, along with another, another couple to have one of those conversations that they've been hosting. And the, the woman on the bus said she wanted to just acknowledge how graceful the woman who lost her daughter was in, in the face of all this. And the woman was visibly distraught. And she said, I wasn't. I was not. She said, when you first started to do this and you invited me for dinner, she said, I'm not going. I hate you. I hated you. But I had to tell myself that, you know, you did change your mind. You started out to look for something and you found something else. So if that can happen, you know, but that's the, that's the mind shift. And, and also mind shifts don't happen. You have to shift your identity, which is the hard part. Uh, Susan, I'm just really glad you got the speaking subsystems working properly. <laughs> the what? Oh, <laughs> your, your, speaking, your speaking subsystems working properly that like totally kicked in. It was great. And and Kevin, you were, you were looking for. I was a thinking ago. maybe I lost. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It's like hiding in the closet or something. But you like revved yeah. it up and it's moving. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, I, I don't know if this is helpful, but I'm. I feel energized and sometimes I say I'm energized and then I don't do anything about it but this time I sort of like even my so my my Russian renter said to me what are you going to do why don't you do something about policy I said I don't know anything about policy and he's been pushing me and he gave me Bill Gates's book so this has been a timely you know um a timely conversation I just can't imagine what it's like to be Bill Gates but that doesn't matter go ahead Kevin well, I, I haven't been on these calls for a while, right? Because I've been actively involved doing some of the pandemic research that you guys are talking about. Oh, good, good, good. We're actually good. involved in doing <laughs> yeah. pandemic choice experiments. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing it in North Carolina and using uh, CARES Act money in the state of Washington. Mm -hmm. We're designing a uh, small and medium-sized business, um, you know, COVID and pandemic experiment uh, dashboard that brings in all of the um, community health data, economic data, 
and quality of life information into a single you know, place that you can hold it in your hand. But for the, to be able to weight it down to the county level, we've run best worst scaling experiments to be able to understand instead of willingness to pay, like, you know, what would you pay for, you know, an object? We're substituting payment for behavior. So what is your willingness to behave relative to wearing a mask, social distancing, cooperation with tracers, um, the ability to, uh, you know, willingness to vaccinate? And so we have that data flowing into the system to weight the ability to understand down to the county level, you know, what will your customers be willing to do if you make a decision as a small business owner, right? And if you need something, all of the resources and links are also in your hand, right? You know, via the mobile phone or the tablet or whatever it is that you're using. So, uh, you know, I've, I've been deeply involved in this. And the fact is that the data flows and being able to sort this out, part of this is just context, is that it's too hard to put the puzzle together. So we're trying to solve the context problem first and then make sure that we're also understanding the fact that, you know, rural, the eastern part of Washington is not the same as the coastal, more urban part of Washington. And in fact, uh, you know, Bellevue isn't the same as Seattle, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the state of uh, Washington Department of Commerce is, you know, the primary client. And I'll just say, it's been eye-opening, <laughs> you know, what people are, you know, saying that, that they're willing to do on one level, but then what they actually disclose when we, you know, ask them in a discrete setting, um, the, uh, it, it's, you know, it's unsettlingly different, right, yeah. shall, shall we say. So I'll, I'll right. just leave it at that, all right, I, I'm, I'm up to my hip boots right now and trying to deliver that product. Um. Kevin, thank you for bringing that to the group. That's, that's uh, I, mean, I love what you're doing. I hope that we're going to be able to take what we've learned and turn this into something that businesses can use when we start to pivot into climate choice experiments mm -hmm. to understand risk and, and so on and so on, because that's next on the roadmap. Exactly. Please keep us in the loop for that. Please keep, at least keep me in the loop for that. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, um, the choice flows business has become a very interesting business, you know, for, for me. And so have you, has anyone in this project sort of taken this down to the streets to figure out how that might become a, a, a beginnings of conversations with people? And, and the place I was going to maybe take the conversation was um, that my favorite change model for, for changing the world is like when somebody you trust takes you by the hand to try something new. That's like an incredible agent for change. Like things really change that way. Uh, and they can't be too different from you. If they're too different from you, you're like, mm, I'm not sure I trust them. Don't know. Don't really want to hear it. They may be trying to teach me something. Don't know. But somebody near you who takes you to try something new, and then the success, of, and then a couple leaps over. But the success of deep canvassing in Georgia and other kinds of places, and I think I sense, and I, Mika would know much better than me, uh, you know, that there's a sea change afoot in how campaigns and politics are perceived to work from the consumer mass marketing way of doing it, which is like we're just going to pour a lot of money into ads and like bombard people kind of like the Lincoln project was doing in part and you know one sliver of a huge the money that was sucked up by the, this last campaign cycle was record breaking I think they were it was double or more any previous uh, political campaign it was huge um, and so how how to go back how can the the, the insights one or even the visibility won by the work you're doing Kevin turn into more human, more relevant, more personal, more local conversations about what the hell to do and whom to trust. I mean, I will, I had a separate conversation with the head of innovation for the UN Refugee Agency about whether, you know, there wasn't a way to adapt this for uh, people making decisions about population flows. And that goes a little bit back to climate, but it also has a lot to do with political climate. Uh, you know, the, what you have to do is you have to uh, find ways to understand and get to data feeds that are small enough. Um, and I'm beginning to believe that the best source of this is data exhaust. 
but you have to be able to approach it in some ethical way. And I recently got named to the Atlantic Council's Geotech Center that's focused on privacy and cybersecurity. And uh, the problem is that, you know, just scraping it is probably not the right way to get it, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, what is the right way to, you know, look at the patterns that you want to get down that are local so that they're actionable and, and that they have that relevance and context, um, but doing it in a way that is visible. I, I heard a quote the other day that I like a lot. It came from my former employer, you know, design area in, in uh, IBM design, which is invisible AI is unethical AI, All right? And so the data training sets, right, that feed it, if they're invisible, it's equally unethical. You know, so, you know, I, I want to, you know, try to figure out how do you get people to want to opt into, you know, participating at a local level and that there's enough participation for it to be a good data training set. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Bill, Micha, you have feet on the street or eyes on the feet on the street. Any, any observations on this or what works or doesn't work? Uh, Bill, we can't hear you. You're unmuted on Zoom, but your audio is not making Bill? it to us. Now you, yes. Okay. I, I've been sort of like trying to follow or, or understand this great reset thing that the World Economic Forum seems to be coming up with, because to, to an extent, if you remember years ago, we talked about the book Great Transformations by Mark Blythe, who was really talking about how at a, not global, but Bretton Woods would probably be the closest thing in, in terms of our history, where the powers that be do get together, realize they've got a problem and come up with a solution which is nothing that anything could ever happen at even a nation level. In other words, to the extent that Biden is getting a little bit of criticism right now and not being you know, totally transparent about where they're coming up with what they're selecting to do and not do, it's like, you know, why are you bothering him? He's busy working on answering those questions. Why does he have to vet them in front of you know, Fox News? You know, he's just gonna trash them no matter what he says. All I'm saying is that, and, and again, I don't know enough about what they're talking about with respect to this uh, global reset, but if the, if the World Economic Forum, which to an extent now is to me, the equivalent of Bretton Woods, is trying to come up with something to deal with a clearly problematic financial system. And clearly they're the 1% that would be most affected by it that's the level at which they're going to address exactly these kind of things. Yes, okay, wipe out Bangladesh, we're going to, that, that's, that's acceptable, but, but they're going to save other places. They're going to save Paris. They're going to save, you know, San Francisco. They're going to fix whatever it is. But, but I'm just thinking that in a way, the doom and gloom assumes that none of that is either capable or, or already happening. I mean, obviously Klaus, um, whatever his name is, Schwab, Schwab. Has, has actually been writing about this for years. And I haven't really got a sense as to whether or not that's really happening or whether or not that, you know, there's a sense as to exactly what they're talking about and how they do it. Does anybody know anything about that? I mean, I've just recently, you know, a couple of days ago ordered the book so that I can try and understand what he's talking about. Um, before turning toward Mika, I'll ask April, who is just unmuted. So how about that? Yeah, um, just a brief comment here. And I think it's still a little bit of a crystal ball. But um, on the one hand, you are right. Klaus Schwab, you can see his writing about stakeholder capitalism, what we would think of as stakeholder capitalism today, back in 1972, right? I mean, he actually does go way back in his thinking. And then if we think about how the World Economic Forum, which was founded in 1974, you know, it's sort of trajectory, which depending on who you are and how you see these things, you know, got co-opted by big business. It's now the global elite, it's private jets, this, that, and the other. You're trying to, not you, Bill, but like one is trying to reconcile these really interesting dynamics as the world has now shifted and we are looking at the um, mess we have created and trying to move forward. So again, I think when it comes to the Great Reset, my best understanding, it is 
highly, highly contingent on who you are and where you sit and what you think the world needs, how you see the Great Reset. Um, and just in the spirit of kind of painting the spectrum, at, at one end, you have people who are simply saying, this is the latest branding, marketing shtick of WEF that's like, and I part, excuse my speech, but that is shit scared about its own future because it is under increasing pressure and um, whatever year on year about how elite it is. And even, and, and it is fear, you know, its own business model depends on seven figure checks written annually by companies worldwide. You know, there's so much of what is constructed that has served it really well over the last few decades. But, you know, what does WEF look like moving forward? It clearly knows it needs to be more inclusive, but how does it make that happen when it's, you know, it's built its business model a lot on, you know, crystal and champagne and, and, and fancy ski slopes. So you've got that on one hand. And then on the other hand, you have, I mean, you've got many different things at play here. Then you've got, of course, Klaus's legacy, right? This guy is 80, he's in his late 80s, and he's just going strong. But everyone knows Klaus does not have forever to leave this organization. And, and this is just a little bit of inside West scoop, there has been an ongoing um, challenge, I don't know, chaos, crisis about succession. What happens when Klaus dies? They brought in a couple of people they thought would be a successor, neither of them worked out. So anyway, I bring this up because think of this, think of the Great Reset also as possibly Klaus's legacy. And then I think in the middle, you have all of the stakeholders who are part of WEF and trying to participate and trying to make a name for themselves and trying to, trying, I think, more and more to do good. Um, but whether, you know, will they do that without Klaus? Hard to say. Is Klaus very much, I think, concerned about the future of the planet and the future of business and all of that? Very much so. But I think he's also trying to reconcile with the fact that, you know, a lot of WEF members have been the ones who have done a lot of damage over the last years. And to get all of them to shift at once is going to be, I think, almost an impossible feat. But the Great Reset kind of puts out his initial framework for where to start, what to do. I would argue, though, that the vast majority of what's part of the Great Reset, it's not new. It's just a repackaging of stuff that we've seen. I shouldn't say repackaging. It, it, it's, it's new in terms of the urgency, but I think a lot of the pieces many of us have already seen before. Anyway, that's a little bit of scoop. And uh, yeah, for those of you who don't know, just final footnote, Davos was going to be in January, then no, can't do it, but they refused to go virtual. So they had this Davos dialogue, which was open to everybody in this you know, week long of, of events. Then they moved Davos to Singapore in May, then they bumped it to August. What I'm trying to get at is even something that, you know, tickets to Davos are not cheap and not hard to get, not easy to get. The, the company cannot bring itself to, like, if they change Davos, that it, it signals this huge change in their business model. And they simply don't seem to be able to do that, which I think is a kind of canary in the coal mine or whatever for the bigger shifts they may have to undertake in the years to come. Thanks, April. Singapore um, in August. Yeah, exactly. What a great time to be there. Well, and everybody who's in Singapore is like, are you insane? Like, that is the worst month of the whole year. So, but I think, obviously, interestingly, I don't know if others of you have experienced this. I think they really have to have another Davos in January next year. <laughs> so they have to have one this year. And they don't care that the weather is horrible, but they can't have it too close to next January. Otherwise, if they have a year in which they have no conference, then members have a very strong case for like, why are they paying membership? And then, you know, things start to crack. It, it's just crazy. I, sorry, but when you get into kind of digging into the weeds of it, it just, it makes, it makes very little sense in some ways. Um, Mika, I was curious just how, uh, how you're seeing the things we're talking about here. Uh, so I have, just two comments about the 2020 is the, what did we call it? The practice year, the training dress year? Dress rehearsal. The dress rehearsal. Kelly called, Kelly called it the dress rehearsal. Um, and did, did anything good happen? I, I did want to flag that, you know, getting many working vaccines um, faster than any of the experts thought possible is kind of uh, a big deal. And, 
Um, you know, so maybe that's there, there's a little glimmer of hope there. But um, the thing that I'm currently mulling um, uh, is the fact that I believe at some point today, if it hasn't happened already, uh, the government has just decided to spend $1.9 trillion. Um, do, has anybody looked at the details of what they're doing? Um, I mean, it's astounding. And while some of it is clearly related to pandemic relief, there are other things in there that are just like, it's been years since the Democrats had sufficient control of Congress to do anything big. And um, we really should recognize what a sea change this is in the current conventional wisdom around um, government spending. Uh, mm -hmm. There is, you know, when Obama came in, his team, the, the economic advisors were like, you know, the economy's in the toilet and we've got to spend at least 1.5 trillion or, and the political people were like, are you kidding? We're not going to go anywhere over 800 billion. Uh, thank you, Rahm Emanuel. And as a result, the, the, the recovery was a weak recovery and it hurt Obama two years later. Um, Oh, it hurt everybody. We went into yeah. austerity, Mika. It was yeah. insane. Yeah. We are not seeing that now. We are seeing unbelievable levels of spending, um, and they're not done. And um, so, you know, I don't think this has really sunk in yet. And it won't for a while, because it'll take a while until we, you know, start to see. I was looking at the spreadsheet that uh, the Senate put out with like all the literally down to the town and county and city name, um, just the $350 billion that's being distributed to, to state and local governments as one-time relief. And it's, it's huge. So it's true that some of this money will get wasted um, or reinforce existing systems rather than transforming them, but it is still a huge, huge change. And um, I'm hoping that they can, you know, for once do a good job of explaining that this is what government can do. It can mm -hmm. actually dramatically make a difference in your life for the better. Um, and we can do more. And so who was it who said earlier that fear is what changes people more than hope? Mm -hmm. um, what I've observed about politics is that when people are um, more hopeful, they make bigger demands. When they're cynical, they withdraw. Yeah. Um, and I don't think uh, any of our movements have done, have been very successful when they try to mobilize people by scaring the shit out of them. Yeah. That's right? true. We have to give people a hopeful vision not a fearful one. If you just tell them that climate disaster is coming, I don't think it mobilizes that many people to be, think about the collective good. It's more like, how do I protect my family? Right. So um, I'm, you know, moderately more hopeful at the moment because of this. And I was, I, I was on an organizing call with my local indivisible group last night and we are exhausted. Everybody is. Just like, you know, I mean, it's, it's been a year. And, and, you know, and we have a monthly meeting and 150 people come, but it doesn't feel like you're really connecting in the way that we used to connect because we can't see each other. So mm -hmm. something has been drained out of us, but I, I was trying to lift people and just say, hey, folks, we got problems, sure, but we just did something really big. You know, we all worked really hard we managed to get the ball over the finish line just barely, but power shifted. And now well, we're seeing results. And so let's see, right? Let's see if we can't build on that. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Brad. Well, I was just going to say, and, and the other good news is democracy survived for another two years, which was a near miracle. I'm, I'm certain that if Trump had not left office, he would be the next president for the next 15 to 20 years. Easy. Yeah, yeah. We were headed right, right that way, exactly. Uh, and just do you, do you think um, his heart would hold out? 
<laughs> he's he's not a, you're not a young man. Replacing does, him with different does parts. Does not have one. Does not have one. Doesn't have to worry about that. Yeah. True. Um, I was just pondering sort of, we may be at a turning point, which is the end of the era that Reagan inaugurated with a hopeful mish, a hopeful vision of that shining city on the hill and morning in America, right? He was selling hope very much. And yet the thing he gave us was government isn't the solution to the problem. Government is the problem, which is which has been like the thing that everybody, every conservative has been pushing super hard. And 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 at this very moment, when Trump spoke at CPAC, um, Democrats are destroying our country is the trope, is the meme, and he will repeat it like every day. And there's a whole bunch of people who are not absorbing any of any other news other than what conservative media is telling them. So they're pretty convinced that the country is on its way right down the tube, straight into the hell hole, and this is going to be awful. So one of the things I admire about Biden's approach to governing right now is ignore the troll, don't feed the troll, just focus on policy and just try to do a bunch of good shit for humans in the country who've been hurt and treat them with dignity and address them treat them with respect and just try to fix their problems. And if they individually in small clusters, kind of the way we were talking about earlier in, the, in this conversation, perceive that changes in fact got to them and caused some rise or some, some improvement in their situation, that may actually be a huge tide that shifts and, and we may see a bend. Otherwise, otherwise we're bumping straight down this lousy path to, to tradition. I, I Go ahead, Mika. One, one uh slight corrective, which is the place where I think the Democrats and the liberal left, et cetera, is, is weakest is in that last mile of communication to people. Yes. That there, that when you, you know, you can look on Facebook and see, you know, the top 10 most shared, you know, posts every day, and they're all right-wing news sites. Um, and the assumption that people are getting the message, team everybody, um, is the, the weak point is at the delivery of the message down at the local level. Um, we've had, you know, we have news deserts, we have people are definitely not all reading the New York Times <laughs> to get, you know, their, their version of reality. Um, and I think that's where, you know, we're seeing some investment there was so much money put into fighting disinformation the last four years that were about everything but that, you know? There's a little bit going to local, you know, strengthening uh, quality local media, but nowhere near enough. So one of my critiques of the system, the political system, is that it got eaten by consumer mass marketing over the last 30, 40 years. And what should have been relationships and actual help and actual listening and participating turned into, we're just gonna bombard you with messages on your media, which is stupid, expensive, not credible, and in fact, a breach of trust in lots of different ways, because it's an invasion of privacy and it's like not actually listening and responding and it's only looking for somebody's attention when they can vote and then going, you know, walking away and doing something else. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, I think that crippled entirely the, the governance apparatus, which had turned into a political apparatus. And I think I, I'm really interested in separating politics from governance and helping helping us get back to work, you know functioning governance, which requires bridging these divides. I mean, in and and it's not that there's divides everywhere because you take you go five miles out of where we live right now into slightly rural uh, Oregon and you are in red territory. You are you you know if you look at the precinct by precinct voting in Oregon, it's very red. Like there's there's Portland, there's there's Salem, there's a couple cities that are that are like blue. The place is red. So it's not that there's a political divide, ten miles out of town. It's unified, just on the opposite side of the fence, right? So how do we how do we do that? I think is hugely important. Uh, very red was like seventy four percent in the next county over. Yeah. Are you are you familiar with the Greater Idaho movement? No, are they trying to take over Montana? I am. No, they're trying to take over big parts of, of Oregon. Oh, shoot. I was just kidding. No, they're trying to take big parts of Oregon, potentially uh, a chunk of Northern California and a chunk of Southeast Washington. Do they yeah, look up greater, greater, greater Idaho. And, even well, and we have Cascadia to combat yes. greater Idaho. So. Yeah. 
I had not heard of this. This is this is dispiriting in some, in some way. <laughs> well, it would be. Um, but thank you, Kelly, for looking on the uh, positive side of this picture. Yeah, exactly. Maybe and we just need to get on Cascadia. And and Tujur, would you like to step back in? <laughs> Uh, step back in with your with your uplifting perspective on on what might actually happen. Uh, no. <laughs> um, no, I. I, I There's I a bridge it, I, too far. I, I tossed a comment in the in the comment chat. Um, a lot, it is struggling that a lot of the pathologies that we are that we're discussing are a consequence of the mismatch between the scale of the population. And the functional scale of the the, the available tools. That basically, the only ways that we had available to reach out to large numbers of people were these kinds of blunt mass media instruments. Actually, that's that has thought. changed. I'm sorry. Uh, conversation what? has always been available. There have always been small Ooh. meetings and churches and everything else. The the idea yeah. that the only way to communicate was through mass media is a fiction. The only way to communicate to 350 million people or Total 7 billion people. Total fiction. Well, bullshit, Jerry. Absolute bullshit. Up until, uh, up until recently, the ability to communicate for small numbers of people to communicate with people outside of their immediate area and have that in a, in a persistent and um, deep way, those tools were limited to mass media, were limited to one-to-many format. That has changed, but the um our behaviors haven't so if you and mean so, everybody listening to roosevelt's fireside chat i'm agreed like in the first radio you know the first nationwide radio broadcast was hoover i think um and so yes everybody hearing the same voice but if you mean touching everybody in the country with something that's relevant to them uh that could make its way through tons and tons of communities susan go ahead yeah we're just gonna just gonna reinforce that jerry which is that um, and Kelly will recognize this too, but if you subscribe to, um, you know, service dominant logic, which I do, um, then, um, then to understand that it, value is created, value and worth not being the same thing, value is created, right, in, in interaction, right, then that's why it has to be conversation. That's why there has to be interaction. That has to be you know, and now we do have some interaction, but it's not at scale as much as you think it is, right? It's between all these little little kingdoms. Well, that, and that's, you know, I've got multiple family members who are very active on Facebook and all they do is share right-wing media posts. <laughs> they don't comment on anything. They don't talk. Yeah. Mm. They're just on autopilot. Wow. Broadcast. One of one of my rhetorical questions, which could be a piece of a remedy, but probably is too late, is what if Zuckerberg had been designing a platform for citizens, not consumers? Right. What what affordances would have been different? What would have been different about identity and privacy? Uh, how might it have created persistent memories and the ability to have to hold civic discourse? Um, all, there's like 15 things that sort of perk up immediately as interesting things that Facebook could have had, could have been, might have done. And my, the open question at this moment is, might it be retrofit to do those kinds of things? Might there be a way, might there be a way to spin out a public benefit organization platform out of Facebook and separate that from the consumery part of the business? I don't know, that, because, because the remedies that, that happened for the Microsoft antitrust suit were stupid and didn't work. And the remedies that happened for the, you know, Bell breaking up uh, Ma Bell into the baby bells, that didn't work either. These were, these were as far as I can tell, non-functioning remedies to really bad sort of monopolist solutions, uh, problems. So, so how could we de-layer this and, and inject a piece that's actually going to be helpful to the discourse we're looking for so that people aren't doing what Brad just described, which is yes. sim simply, forward, you know, share, sharing uh, media objects that half of which are probably created on purpose for their shareability and are, have no bearing in reality. A stock market uh, transaction micro tax. Uh, the Tobin tax. Yeah. Yeah. Love the Tobin if tax. Do, if you do, if you do something that, that is a, it, well, as. You mean to fund Mika this? Or? Earlier, you know, Mika just added, it, it would VCs have been interested in making sure that it won if it wasn't what it is. Well, if we, why is it that VCs are the 
uh, are the determining factor here. You know, why is it that the stock market, that hedge fund managers, you know, that Wall Street bets on Reddit are all, you know, the determining factors here? What can we do to dissuade without destroying the system? Mm -hmm. So, you know, rather than doing, you know, having the solution be something that is directly, directly related to the, you know, the intricacies and nuances of Facebook, or even more broadly to the tech industry in general, why don't we look at the, and we should be looking at the underlying factors. Yeah, get rid of Cuomo, just fucking Cuomo. <laughs> I know, damn, damn. Um, um, just briefly, uh, Tom, Bo, uh, you wanna jump in? Like, where, where are your hearts and minds at this moment? Go for it, Tom. Hello, everybody. I'm sorry I'm being so quiet. It's It's been forever since I've been in one of these, so it's good to see all some old faces here. Um, and Getting honestly, older every day. <laughs> um, I, it's, it's hard for me, like Susan, I'm trying to figure out if my words are going to work because I've been so isolated for so long. Um, but everything that that you've all been talking about, some of the stuff I've been reading about would be, you know, this concept of um, identity and membership, Jerry, and, and then trying to frame it in terms of like what Jane Meyer and Kurt Anderson and Applebaum, all those folks have been writing about how the political economy is really set up so that we are stressing a lot of people in this country. And so, but their reaction is masterfully crafted through these, you know, pass along the right wing media things that you're talking about. They're not going to be dissuaded through argument because their identity is so uh, tied up in this. And then you add the racial component to it where it's such an emotional component. And if you can, you know, the fact that there's such a large percentage of people who have erroneously blaming their problems on these scapegoats, these other reasons, versus the fact that if they looked at how the tax policy and the political economy was structured, they would realize that other countries do a much better job of not creating this precariat that we have that's just expanding so greatly. And if you have this precariat, instead of helping them, you harness their, their anger, their fear, you have a very powerful weapon and a weapon that's going to allow you to go against the demographic tide shift that's going on right now, right? Look at some, you know, the, the Republican party is hanging on to gerrymandering. They're hanging on to right. voter suppression. They were hanging on Being to- Being very blunt about it. The, oh, yeah, yeah. The, the filibuster the and, and, the dem, and the fact that, you know, if you look at the divide of red states versus blue states, how many is the Senate is so overwhelmingly shifted toward, you know, giving more power to the red side. These are things I'm thinking about. I'm just swirling around with those and trying to figure out how do we how do we help? Because honestly, I've had friends that I left in Georgia. I'm now living in Colorado. That these people in Georgia, I'm just getting, I'm realizing I'm getting more and more distance from them. And I'm cutting off relationships because we've grown to become so polarized. Mm. I mean, people that I used to, you know, hang out with. Anyway, that's where my head is right now. I, well, I love just, a lot. Yeah. No, to pile on that, I mean, there's this uncanny psychology that I've encountered with close friends and personal family members, most of who all live in Florida now that I live in California. Um, I'd rather be right. I don't care the benefits of your argument. I don't care what's in it for me. I don't care my economic status could change. I don't care that we have a better future for my kids. I'd rather be right. I enjoy being right. <laughs> wow. Well, that's identity, Brad. Yeah, you're right. It's identity. And yeah. I too have relatives like you that I get to see the sewer and Facebook be republished all the time. Uh, is it my turn to talk? Can I go? Yeah, Jared? yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. please. All right. So I, uh, history uh, rhymes. It doesn't necessarily repeat. Culturally and politically, I feel this, uh, this I feel like I'm living in the Weimar Republic, uh, America style. And I'm, I'm very serious. This is very Weimar Republic. This is a liminal period that, you know, three years from now or two years from now, this could be real bad. And there's a lot of forces going on. And this is a very treacherous time. <clears throat> brief, brief, inter brief interjection here. Um, there was a really nice article that was talking about how uh, Orban and a couple other of the far right populist uh, people who are busy turning their countries into dictatorships 
won an election back in the 80s, 90s, then were out of power for five to 10 years, then came back in and kind of did it right and got all the mechanisms working to the point where they may be, you know, prime ministers for life right now. But but that was part of, that was part of the fear of, of sort of this might be Trump's time in the wilderness and then he or one of his offspring could end up coming back in a, the way I think you're referring to, Bo. Yes, and, and let's not forget that our, our, the Senate is by with, with the vice president. It's not like we have this crushing political mandate. No, we do not. And we better do something and do it right in, the, in these two years. And, and I'm really glad because the party is definitely acting like that. They know, like all these wonderful uh, work tax credits for children and everything. They're really helping the working class out. I mean, it's for real. They're really doing it. And I'm so relieved. Anyway, okay, so uh, Weimar Republic, but economically, we are living in the 1940s. If you look at the debt levels we have, it's, it's the 1940s. And what just happened this last year in the dress rehearsal was, when the depression happened, we had deflation, which is very, very hard to stop. And we decided, and Her Herbert Hoover, we just couldn't get our head around, people didn't deserve it. So the depression, we were out of about a year and a half. And I remember Jamey really was shocked one day when I said the depression happened because of policy error. It was very easy to fix. Um, and in fact, we almost fixed the depression several times, but then we had to keep going back to blaming people and back to austerity. And uh, you can actually see like three times in the 30s, we were coming out and then they balanced the budget, went back into austerity and went right back. And the yeah. rubric of the time was, oh, the, we're not saving the banks. There was always somebody's scapegoat. And we went right back into the toilet. Uh, I love that somebody today mentioned um, Bretton Woods because what happened to Bretton Woods uh, was that the, the world elites were worried that as soon as we came out of the war, we were gonna go back into depression. And they, they'd already lived through the chaos of depression and world war. And they were determined not to let it happen again. Um, so back to the 1940s. So we're in the 1940s. We are all going to have, well, there's tremendous resources being spent. And I remember when I've said here before, when I was, I was joking, but I was trying to be really clear. An economy is really just what you decide to do with your resources. And if you're Egypt, you build cities for the dead. It really is that simple. What are you going to do with your resources? And, uh, and, and what this last year was a dress rehearsal of is, we can do with whatever we want with our resources and nobody has to really suffer unnecessarily. And yes, it's possible. And in the forties, you realize we got out of the depression because war, we could all get behind. Okay. We could get behind war and we inflated and we, we, we uh, debased our currency and you couldn't old gold and you couldn't old silver. And by the way, we shifted money from rich to poor. Um, in fact, we rebalanced the system and I could go through how financial oppression works, but we actually, readjusted wealth in this country. And in fact, the Federal Reserve is gonna be doing the exact same thing again. So this is a very liminal time and we can get a lot done. And it's almost like the perfect time to have it done. This is the forties, except we're not in a world war. And uh, so there's, there's a lot of hope in that. Not I, I, yet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, agreed, Susan, agreed. That's you, what I kind of said, <laughs> I'm a republic. You could, you could say this is a time of flux or something like that. Yeah. It's a very risky liminal time. And um, yeah, anyway. So that, those are my thoughts. Um, so we've made a grand tour of many, many things. Um, are there we things- We start out with me trying to be hopeful and we end up with Bo just bringing us all down. <laughs> I was bringing us down. No, 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 he didn't bring us down. There's hope. I'm blaming there. Susan. She was the one like, well, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I just could tell. And that. Brad is putting a cheerful article in the chat. Yeah, we, right. Yeah. We have the resources, and we're we're and we're not. And we can do it. We can do whatever we yeah. want. We can do whatever yes. we want. We Damn know it. what we need to do. We know that we can do it. We have the tools. We have the means. We have the resources. So it's just a question of do can we do it? But will we do it? And will we do it fast enough? Yeah, and to me, the question behind that is like, we must dissolve in some sense the political divide, the great lockup. We must figure out how not to be half the po world's population against half the world's population, basically frozen in our ability to, to collaborate to solve these things. 
Well, one thing I heard the other day, which I really found fascinating was regarding the, the Republicans and the gerrymandering and everything. It's like they they are this party, which their membership, they, they can't win without cheating. Yes. They, they're essentially a, a rural fringe party that they're not even centrist. That mean, so, I mean, we could be seeing their death. We could be seeing the end of that party. Yeah. That's why this is very Weimar Republic. This could be their end, or this could be a horrible re-rising of them. Right. This is what, but it could be their end, too. Mika, yeah. is, that a, is that a truism, or do you buy that? Sorry, that, what? That, that the Republican Party currently could not win without voter suppression. Right, it's winning in, you know, plenty of states. I, I'm not sure without voter suppression, if voting, if, if, if more everybody... than they have now or, the, or what they've already got. Are they a valuable national party without gerrymandering and, and, and suppression? Are, if, we were, if we were to do statistics, statistical redistricting, everybody got to vote immediately, uh, mail-in voting everywhere or whatever, if we were to wipe the slate clean and make sure everybody's fran everybody was enfranchised with lots of time to vote, would Re Republicans be winning elections? Not these Republicans, no. But, you know, they'd probably regroup. I mean, I don't know that we would, you know, see them disappear yeah, and some right. new party. Um, but yeah, this particular, you know, white Christian nationalist collection, they they figured out a model that works pretty well for them right now and they're trying to keep it. Yeah. yeah. Um, Tom or Brad, I think you wanted to jump in. Yeah, it's just yes, so the conversation just now reminded me of Heather McGee's new book. I've just got it and it's just uh, just getting into it. Because I, I still believe that there's a, a great many of people whose identity is so tied up in the Republican Party, it's hard to get them to change. So they still will be a viable party for quite a while. And I'm wondering how helpful books like this, because she's trying to point out in a very, if you read the book, it starts, she has a very good voice. She doesn't have a, I'm right, you're wrong kind of a mentality. Uh, Rosa Brooks, her latest book has that same kind of, of a feel to it. But it's still a, I'm trying to persuade you kind of an argument, right? You're voting against your own interest. I don't know how we get that argument to stick when people's identity is so caught up in, I don't want an American government that's helping all the black people, so I'm gonna vote against all those Democrats. When in truth, she's got data showing that by voting in that way, you're actually hurting yourself. Um, and so how do we work together to, to change how people see this concept of, I am a loyal re Republican, and we can take that identity and still keep it and still make it a more useful identity but mm -hmm. not one that is so knee-jerk polarized against almost everything that is a government-backed solution. Is the book you just mentioned, The Sum of Us? Yes. Okay, yeah. here's the link to it. That's why I like what the Democrats are doing right now and, the, and helping with the child tax credit. They've got to really help the working class and do it now, whether they're voting for you or mm -hmm. not. And if you don't do it, God help you. Between now and the next election, that's gotta be a priority. Yeah. Did you see the, I, I put a link a, a little while ago to a Washington Post article from yesterday that broke down the the, uh, st the differences between uh, the Trump tax cuts and the you know, the Biden plan, um, just in terms of who gets helped. And it's it's staggering. Are they orthogonal? It really is. Um, you know, they're, they're mirrors of each other in many ways. Um, <laughs> is where it, did you put that? Yeah, where did you put that? Oh, it's in the chat. It's just oh, scroll it's up in a the chat. Bit. Oh, there we go. Um, Oh no! I no, it's not mine. Oh, it should be in everybody's. It's the Washington Post. Uh, it was at ten fourteen. Uh, sorry, that was uh, that was. Susan. Could you repost, please? That was I'm mine. reposting. Yeah, yeah. yeah Jim, may please repost. Yep. Cool. Any well, um. The key thing is, will people recognize that this is the difference between Democrats and Republicans? And I I did spend some time looking at this as recline. There are a bunch of people who've written about the problem of hidden government um, that people don't know, number one, uh, when they're using a government service. So yeah. when you survey people and ask them, when was the last time you got a government benefit? Uh, many of them have no idea. Mm -hmm. right? And that isn't only because they don't think of Medicare or Social Security as a government program. Uh, but they don't think of the highway uh, that they're driving on either. Um, so 
you know, how people come to understand what is happening is pretty important um, yeah. as a product of the people who want to make government work for you. Those are the Democrats. I, I, uh, Why don't said, the Democrats actually make that happen? They're, we're trying to get them to do that. There's a, you know, the, the wonks versus the, you know, the, the organizers. And to some degree, um, you know, I think some of the, the, good, the good news is that Biden seems to intuitively understand. He tried to get Obama in 2009 to do more, to take a victory lap. And Obama, it was like beneath him. It wasn't something he was going to do. And I think Biden is definitely planning to do that. Um, the other thing, which may just be temporary, is the division in the Republican Party um, and the degree to which they're completely distracted by Trump has worked to the Democrats' benefit. There was no, like no meaningful opposition. They, they never put together uh, a successful attack on, on this bill um, from the, the Republican side. And that was really striking. It's mm -hmm. also quite popular. <laughs> well, so, mm -hmm. Dr. Seuss helped the situation, you know? Yeah. yeah. If they were distracted by Mr. Potato Head and Dr. Seuss. Yeah, exactly. All of Which them. is totally fine. They can have those. <laughs> like the, no problem. I, I'm going to have to remind everyone that, you know, getting employment and everything back when we're out of this is really hard. Well, it involves uh, rethinking what uh, employment even is. This, it's not like there's a whole bunch of full-time employment, full-time jobs that are going to come back. There's a bunch of work that'll exist, and it needs to be picked up and used in different ways. And that's going to that's going to highlight our lack of nationalized healthcare, because once once you're in you know once you're in optional work that's got small chunks, and you have no no you know. There's something in the no bill company. that increases government subsidies for Cobra to a hundred percent. Which I haven't had the time to unpack, but if that if I'm reading that right, it seems to sound like if you lose your job and need to buy into Cobra, the government will just pay for it. That's mm. crazy. Oh That's crazy. wow. Um, so one of my questions, long time questions, has been why do businesses still want to be responsible for insurance? Why do they want to have anything to do with so health insurance? And, and the, only, the only answer I can find is that it's sticky. Like you're gonna have to stay my employee even though you don't want to because you can't leave because you'll lose your benefits. And, and it's an artifact of World War II when we introduced benefits in order because prices, uh, because wages were frozen, I get that. So the World War II changed every country's healthcare system in a different way. I would submit a bill to basically get business out of the business of healthcare entirely and then see what happens. You're lucky my wife has an area who had to re, re, um, re renegotiate with the healthcare people every year for her company. Oh, God. Horrible stuff. <laughs> Nightmare. Yeah. Just Nightmares. And the, and the numbers are always going up and it's always worse. Yeah. Uh, I want to add another thing. You know, Janet Yellen, former head of the Federal Reserve, who studied inequality. And that's where her academic studies and economics were. Uh, we have an unprecedented cooperation between the Fed and the Treasury, which is exactly what happened in World War II. Hmm. So, I mean, we do have a dream team right now in the White House. We have a dream team. And I'm very happy. Climate, especially. What, what he's doing with climate and energy is amazing. I mean, yeah. far more than I expected. Not crazy about agriculture. Same guy who oversaw the crappy system we have now. But I don't know enough to be really critical, but we really need rethinking of, of how agricultural subsidies happen, that the farm bill needs to be like thrown up in the air and broken. Uh, pinata, the farm bill is what I would say. And like, yeah, the, the whole, that whole system is really dysfunctional in many ways. And I don't oh, think- Oh, a new Vils verb, a new Vils verb. Pinata, A yeah. new verb. <laughs> I don't think Vilsack is, is up to the job to, to actually change it at all. Um, we're at the end of our, our call time. It has been lovely to see everybody again on the month mark. It's too bad nothing's happened over the last year uh, to keep us in conversation. And, um, and, 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 and you just heard Jermaine sounding incredibly optimistic. It's great. He's going to rename himself. it be too sure. <laughs> Thanks, Jermaine. That was a wonderful video. I just want to say. It was great. It was. Thank you. Super. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, happy birthday. I Yes. Oh, yes. that's right. Oh my God, I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. I'm so sorry. <laughs>
<laughs> okay. One, two. It's all right. Happy birthday. I have a different song. Like we can't do the funeral dirge. It goes like this. Oh, this I love the funeral dirge. This is your birthday song. It is a very long. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> love it. <laughs> oh, the birthday dirge that I heard was, you've heard the birthday dirge. It's a different one, right? Oh, it's the, it's uh, the usual one when everybody sings at this speed. No, no, no. Happy birthday. You don't well, want a different... to kill grandpa while you're singing it. There's a different happy birthday. Happy, oh, birthday. happy birthday. Pain and sorrow everywhere. People dying in the air. Something like that. Happy birthday. Which feels to me like a like a Mr. Doom kind of birthday song, doesn't it? It is. And it's to the sound to the tune of the song of the Volga Boatman. Yes. Yes, it's perfect. I just have to say that that's uh, the ideal birthday song. That's, actually, for those of you who are of, of the right age, Altered Images' Happy Birthday is actually my, my favorite birthday song. Oh, good. I don't know okay. if any of you remember that song. But... I like the Stevie Wonder version, but OK. We'll so out. happy birthday, Jemay. Thank, thank you all you. for being here. Kelly, thank you for remembering that. I, yes. I'm like, go ahead. No worries. Uh, and and th thank you. Mostly thank you for, for actually taking the time to watch the video. I, I, I always feel like I'm throwing these things out into the void. And it's really, it's really gratifying to get a response. You know, and that, that it's a good response is even better. But just simply hearing back is, is, is very meaningful for me. So thank you. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone. Carol. Bye. 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 Bye.